Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza. This is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we bring you the story of Paul Arizin, one of the early superstars of the NBA. He entered the NBA in the fall of 1950, the same year as Bob Cousy. Now, I will not get as worked up as I did last week in sharing the story of Bob Davies. If you caught last week's episode, I was pretty fired up because Bob Davies is hands down one of the best players that ever laced them up in the NBA. But he did not even make the list of the top 50 players in NBA history back in 1996. Not so with Paul Arizin. He made that same top 10 list in 1971 and he made the top 50 list in 1996. So he does receive official recognition for his accomplishments as an NBA player. But due to the fact that he played so long ago, he is rarely in any current conversations of top players. This is a guy who made the All-Star Game 10 times. He was an All-Star Game MVP. He was All-NBA First Team three times. He was a two-time league scoring leader. And he won a championship in 1956. So I want to share his story with you today. He was born on April 9th, 1928 in Philadelphia. This guy barely left the city of Philadelphia unless it was to play a game somewhere else. Very rarely does a guy get to play his entire life in one city. Ayerson did not even play high school basketball. He only tried out for his senior year, but he was cut. His coach just did not think he had the potential or the skill to help the team, which seems so odd to me. Ayerson was 6'4 and really athletic. Who would not want a player like that on his team, especially in the mid-1940s? But that did not stop him from playing. He had been playing in the CYO, the Catholic Youth Organization, for years in their youth basketball program. He also played in other church leagues throughout the city. If there was a game to play, he would play. He just loved the game so much, so it was in these local community leagues that he continued to hone his skills. He was also one of the very early jump shooters. Arizin said that the reason he started to jump for his shot was that so many of the games he played were played on ballroom dance floors where they would use portable baskets. While these dance floors were often waxed on purpose to help with certain dance moves where spinning was necessary. But a slippery floor was not good for basketball. So rather than try to stop on a dime and shoot a set shot where he would often slip, Arizin began to shoot a running jumper because he felt his shot was more stable. So then he made the jump shot part of his offensive game. For his day, he was a deadly shooter. Then he went to Villanova University in Philadelphia as a regular student where he majored in chemistry. His enrollment at the school had nothing to do with basketball. But while studying chemistry, he continued to play CYO basketball in his free time. One day, near the end of his freshman year, Al Severance, the Villanova basketball head coach, was watching one of Arizon's games and really liked the way that he played and he thought to himself that maybe he could convince Arison to come to school at Villanova. So he approached Arison after the game and asked him how would he like to come to Villanova, and Arison said, I already go to Villanova. Of course, Severance could not ask for anything more. He brought Arison onto the basketball team as a sophomore, where Arison played for three years, but he soon discovered that he had trouble keeping up with his chemistry studies while also devoting time to the basketball team. So he made a decision to switch his major to accounting, which is the degree he graduated with. During his senior year at Villanova, he averaged 25 points per game and led the nation in scoring. He once scored over 100 points in a game, but the NCAA does not recognize it since he scored those points against a two-year school. 
If you caught episode 45 on Bevo Francis, then you know how important it is for the NCAA record book for four-year schools to play other four-year schools. Those are the only records that will count in the NCAA. In any case, Arizon was the National Player of the Year, and it was a sure bet to be a top pick in the NBA draft. However, Arizon had not really given any thought to playing professional basketball. Back then, salaries were not that great, and most players with a college degree could make more money in the corporate world than they could in the NBA. At the time he graduated, he had every intention of just trying to find an accounting job and playing basketball on the weekends in local leagues. But the Philadelphia Warriors contacted Arizon about playing for them. Arizon was definitely aware of the NBA and had been to a few games, so he figured, why not? If the salary was anything close to what he could get as an accountant, then he would give it a try. Back then, the NBA still had the territorial pick. Now, I have talked about this before, but for those that are new to the show, I will give you a brief explanation. The territorial pick was an option that each team had at the draft. If there was a college star that played within 75 miles of the team's arena, that team could just claim that player via the territorial pick. That team would then forfeit their first round pick because essentially the territorial pick was their first round pick. The team would then rejoin the draft in the second round. In the case of Arizon, the Philadelphia Warriors wanted him desperately. Since Arizon played his college basketball just down the street from the Warriors arena, he was an easy territorial pick. He automatically went to the Warriors and never had to leave Philadelphia. Well, that's a good place to take a break. I'll be right back and I will continue with Arizon's move to the NBA right after this. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and let us continue with the story of Paul Arizon and the beginning of his NBA career. Back then, the NBA salary cap was far different than it is today, and rookies had a lot more room to negotiate their contract. Arizon negotiated a bonus to his NBA salary. The Warriors front office happened to be located above a movie theater in downtown Philadelphia. So, the team arranged that the theater owners let Arizon go to the movies for free anytime he wanted to. Now how's that for an NBA bonus? He made an instant impact on the Warriors. He came in and averaged 17 points and 10 rebounds per game and won the 1951 Rookie of the Year award over Bob Cousy. He was also selected to the NBA All-Star Game as a rookie. In fact, Arizon is one of only a handful of players who made the All-Star Game every single year that they played. The other three are Bob Pettit, Jerry West, and Yao Ming. Now, you might be thinking, how did Michael Jordan not make it every season he played? But I have to take you back to 1995 when Jordan came back from his baseball career to play the final 17 games of the 1995 season, which was after the All-Star Game had already been played. So technically, he played part of that season without being an All-Star. So back to Paul Arizon's story. After just two years in the NBA, he decided to put his playing career on hold and join the Marines for two years and serve in the Korean War. Even during the war, he played basketball for various military teams in order to stay in shape and stay sharp. After two years of serving in Korea, he returned home and resumed his playing career with the Warriors. Now, you might be thinking, didn't he miss those two All-Star games while he was in Korea? It is true, he did not make those All-Star games, but he also did not play a single game in either of those two seasons. So technically, he still made the All-Star game in every season that he played in. But a championship proved elusive even though he teamed up with fellow Hall of Famer Neil Johnston. The reason is that they kept running into George Mikan and the Minneapolis Lakers. Even Arison referred to those Laker teams as the New York Yankees of the NBA. The Lakers just had too much firepower for any team to overcome. However, everything came together in the 1955-1956 season. The Warriors were able to use their territorial pick that year to grab future Hall of Famer Tom Gola from LaSalle University. Ernie Beck had also returned from the war and had given them a solid player off the bench. That year, Arizon and Johnston were the number two and number three scorers in the league. 
More importantly, George Mikan had just retired and the Lakers were not the powerhouse team that they used to be. If the Warriors were ever going to win the championship with this team, then 1956 had to be the year. They had the best record in the league at 45-27, and 27, which was six games better than the next best team, the Boston Celtics. In the finals, the Warriors played the Fort Wayne Pistons and beat them four games to one and clinched the title on their home floor in front of their own fans. Arizon has said that the 1956 championship was the best moment of his professional career. Despite all of the individual accolades, he preferred team success. Unfortunately for the Warriors and the rest of the league, the following year was the year that Bill Russell joined the league. He supercharged the Celtics and led them to 11 championships over the next 13 years. In 1959, the Warriors brought in Will Chamberlain to help bolster the roster. That at least gave the Warriors a fighting chance. But the Celtics were still too much, even for a team with Will Chamberlain. They were never able to overcome the Celtics with that Warriors team. After 10 seasons in the NBA, he decided to retire at the end of the 1962 season. That was when the Warriors announced that they were leaving Philadelphia and moving to California to become the San Francisco Warriors. Arizin did not want to leave Philadelphia. Even though he still had a few more years in him, he decided to stay home in Philadelphia. Besides, he had a job offer to be an accountant with IBM, and it paid him much more money than playing for the Warriors. So that made his decision very easy. He ended up staying with IBM for 23 years until he finally retired from work altogether. At the time that he retired from the NBA, he had scored 16,266 points, which put him in third place on the all-time scoring list. However, today, he is number 110 on the all-time scoring list, as over 100 guys have passed him in the over 60 years since he retired. But he did not retire from basketball completely when he left the NBA. After the Warriors left for San Francisco, Arizon played for three years in something called the Eastern Professional Basketball League. He joined a team called the Camden Bullets, which played right across the Delaware River from Philadelphia in Camden, New Jersey. If you've ever been to Philadelphia, then you know that downtown Philadelphia is connected to Camden via the Ben Franklin Bridge. With good traffic, you can get from one city to the other in less than 10 minutes. So even then, Arizon was able to continue living in Philadelphia. Seriously, this guy was not leaving Philly for anybody. Some people think that the most famous athlete out of Philadelphia is Rocky Balboa, but it should be Paul Arizon. He was the local boy made good. He even won the MVP of the Eastern League in 1963, which made sense since he was still at the top of his game when he moved to this lesser league. He also led the Bullets to the Eastern League Championship in 1964. His number 11 is retired by Villanova University. However, his number 11 is not retired by the Warriors. Clay Thompson wears that today. But it is up to each team to decide which jersey to retire, so I will not make a big fuss of it. But nonetheless, Paul Arizon needs to be remembered as one of the greatest to ever play in the NBA. Well, that does it for today. That is the story of Paul Arizon. Join us next time when we share the story of when John Havlicek stole the ball. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that will help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There, you will find shorter historical posts, as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. 
To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.